But at the same time, this church was probably one of the most diverse church with many ethnicities and new converts to Christianity. Uh, historians say that the church at that time, in fact, the, the nations of that time that were part of the Roman um, Empire, 60, 70 percent were slaves that had been brought to different places in the empire from other, from their home nation. Unity is important to God because the church is his body of which Jesus is the head and he doesn't want division in his body. In fact, if you'll just look for a moment at chapter 1, verse 22, this is the first mention of the church in Ephesians. It's mentioned nine times in the book of Ephesians, but this is the first mention. And it says this, and he put all things under his feet, that's Christ, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Well, that's quite a statement to say that the church is the fullness of Jesus Christ. That's what God is saying. That's what Paul is saying about God's people because he dwells in the church and therefore that is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Many of the letters to the churches were written in order to correct division for whatever reason in the churches so people could walk together so they could have fellowship together as fellow believers. Unity is evidence of supernatural grace. It's evidence of humility. It's evidence of spiritual maturity. And it's evidence of the Spirit's presence in that body of believers. That's one of the reasons why Jesus said to his disciples in John 13, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. See, division doesn't grow where there is agape love, where there is grace that is overflowing, where there is this lowliness of mind, humility, selfless and sacrificial love. A divided body does not bring glory to God. A divided body does not attract people to Christ. That's why he said, this commandment I give to you, that you love one another. But a unified body under the headship of Christ and indwelt by the Spirit of God is a powerful witness to unbelievers. And that's why Satan will do everything in his power to divide, destroy, endanger the powerful unity within a local church. If your Bible is open to verse 22 of chapter 1, I want you, what I want us to do is I want us to answer that question now. Why did Paul have to deal with church unity? Why was this a topic of such importance that he gives several chapters to it? He mentions it here first. Notice what follows in chapter 2. And you he made alive. And he's going to answer who the you is in a moment. You who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. 
How many of you were saved later in life? And by that, I mean not as a child or a teenager. How many of you? A lot of you. Do you remember what it was like when you got saved and the, the total transformation there was? And, you, and the reason why I ask those of you that were, le- that were saved later in life is because some of us were saved, you know, and we grew up in a Christian home. We maybe even made a profession. We were very young, but later we, um, we made assurance of that. And because we had conscientious Christian parents, they, they you know, there were limits on us. So our sin nature could not go as far as maybe it liked, it wanted to. But you as an adult, when you were saved, you, you saw the transformation. You saw what it was like. There were worldly habits you gave up. There was maybe language you gave up. You dressed a little differently. See, all of those things are a result of the transformation that God does in our life. And so when he's talking here about these Corinthian or these Ephesian believers, most of them were first generation Christians. And so they could look back on their life. They they lived lives of immorality because they were serving false gods with whom that worship involved immorality. Their whole life was given over to lust. And they, it describes, they would have described themselves as children of wrath, just as the others. But remember, Paul also identified himself as that. Because he, he uses the we. We all once conducted ourselves. So even though Paul grew up in a very religious home where the law of God was taught, there was a point in his adult life where he realized that God, none of that saved him. None of of that gave him favor before God. He was lost. Now notice where the change comes here in verse 4. You know, once we were children of wrath, just as the others, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, which which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, not our own, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you to just keep thinking, okay, who's the you in all this? Who's the we in all this? All right, let's go on. Verse 11. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, you follow what it's saying there? That they were called the circumcision or the uncircumcision by the circumcision. The circumcision didn't want anything to do with the uncircumcised. And at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And the word commonwealth there really, it just means the citizenship of Israel. You were outside of Israel. And strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he, that's Christ, for he himself is our peace, 
Notice he's still using the plural pronoun here. He is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinance. Now, why would he call the law of God the enmity that was against us? Well, because the law condemned us because we were sinners. So as to create in himself one new man from the two. So who are the two? What? No. No, these are the two, the one. Uh, notice back in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man. So he, the both one to create one new man. Who were those two? Yeah, it's the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew and the Gentile. That's why he, in verse 11, he makes it very clear. You, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called or who are called uncircumcision by the circumcision, the Jews, the Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcision, and at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from Israel. But now, within the church, he has made those two one. Now, friends, that's like taking vinegar and water, or vinegar and oil, I'm sorry. Vinegar and oil and trying to make them mix. And that's a miracle through the grace of God. Now, when I'm talking about Jews and Gentiles, I'm talking about saved Jews and Gentiles. So in this Ephesian church, there were Jews and Gentiles. And those Jews were believers in Christ. They had left Judaism as they knew it, or at least they were practicing it now in a new way not for the works, not to work their way to heaven, but to receive Jesus Christ's gracious gift through his son who shed his blood for them. And that now they see that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God that was pictured in the Old Testament. And all of those sacrifices had that meaning. They were pointing to that. And so... Through this whole passage, notice in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And then in chapter 3, he talks about a mystery that's now a reveal. What was that, that mystery? Well, look in verse 6. Here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Now, we know that the church started with the Jews in Acts chapter 1 or Acts chapter 2. And many Jews got saved at that point. But as a whole, the nation of Israel rejected their Messiah. And therefore, God called Paul to be the missionary to the Gentiles because the Jews had rejected him. And he said, now I'm going 
to the Gentiles as God had directed him. And so this was the mystery that no one understood from the Old Testament. But God now is revealing this to him and, it, and to us as well. Notice in uh, verses 8 through 11, he says, To me who am less than the least of all the saints. Do you hear what he said? What does that remind you of? The least of all the saints. What? Okay, chief of sinners. And what is one of the, what is one of the characteristics of unity? Lowliness of mind. And Paul is demonstrating that even though, my word, it would be easy for him to be proud. He's been given all this revelation. The majority of the epistles in the New Testament were written by him. Peter, Peter, the, the kind of the head of the apostles, even said, Paul has given to us things that are even hard for me to understand. And he, he recognized Paul in that way, and yet Paul said to, to everybody else, I'm the chief of sinners. I am the least of all the saints. <laughs> this grace was given to me, the least of all the saints, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. The church still has that same purpose. We are still... Uh, making known to principalities and powers, angels, demons, the wisdom of God. And that's only through Christ. Notice verse 20 of chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice that Paul, a Jew, is recognizing that the church now is God's principal means of revealing Jesus Christ to the world. It's not Israel. Someday Israel will recognize their Messiah, but it is not Israel because Israel turned away from their, their God and now they're trying to pursue God by means of their own righteousness. And many of the Jews don't even follow God. So, in several places, he says, like, for instance, in um, chapter 2, verse 12, having no hope and with God, without God in the world, hope is one of these seven things that are mentioned here in chapter 4. Note verse, chapter 2, verse 14, who has made both one. He emphasizes that, just like he's emphasizing it here in chapter 4. And then in verse 15, so as to create in himself one new man from two. There's really only two peoples that God is recognizing, and that is Gentiles and Jews. All the other ethnicities or nations are, are contained in the, in the description of, of the Gentiles. Verse 16, he said that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. And then in verse 18, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So the mystery is the church and how all of these diverse people can be one, can be unified, can be 
one body. That's why he emphasizes now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. It's truly a, a phenomenon that two groups could be one in Christ who are so different. And the two groups here, even within the Jews, you, you would have at least two groups. One would be the Orthodox Jews, those who were still somewhat true to, um, to all the Old Testament laws and keeping them. But then you have the Hellenized Jews who, who tried to fit into the culture and they really became, in many ways, almost like the culture. And then you have the Gentiles who had come out of all kinds of depravity. But when they got saved, and when Jews got saved, and Hellenized Jews got saved, there was a difference, there was a change. And they were one in Christ, and now they had to learn to get along together. And Orthodox Jews were, were going to church with Gentiles who grew up in that lifestyle, and yet now they were in Christ. They want to live righteously, but it's all new to them. And then you have Jews who grew up with all of these rituals and ordinances and um, sacrifices that they were supposed to keep, although the, the temple at this time had been destroyed in 70 AD. But they were still trying to keep a lot of the uh, a lot of the laws. And now, Paul was teaching that all of that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so, a, a lot of these people didn't know what to do. And that's why we have all of these scriptures written to, uh, to teach them what is next. Now, let's make this really applicable, relevant. You know, like it or not, our government's open border policy has brought the world to the United States. Last week when I was down in Arizona at a church there for the um, Foundations Baptist Fellowship board meeting, um, on Tuesday night at the service, they had, it was either four or five people that gave their testimonies. One was Chinese. One was, had been a Muslim. One um, was Mexican. And I don't remember what the other one was. I don't remember who it was. But they were all very diverse. And, but they all spoke English so you could understand them. And, um, but the pastor was just emphasizing the fact that the world has come to us and it's an, it's an opportunity for us to reach the lost. You know, we can, we can think of all these religious groups that are coming into our country that don't want to change and accept the American way, but those people need Christ like anyone else. And God has brought them to our doorstep. And there are, there are people that are truly being saved as a result, some of which want to go back to their own people and witness to them. Uh, last Wednesday night, I read the Needham's prayer letter, and in that prayer letter, they had mentioned that they had had a some special meetings with a, a Muslim who had been converted and was now going around the world and the United States and was there with them, teaching them how to reach Muslims, Fulani people that are so indigenous to that area. And that is what we're dealing with. And so... Think about the many issues that come up even in a church like this. 
For instance, the translation issue. What translation should you use for reading the Bible? That is a divisive issue today. And it helps if we understand those issues so that we can talk to people and help them to come to the right conclusions. And sometimes people who don't even know about that, suddenly they come in contact with who says that this particular translation is inspired. And all of a sudden that puts doubts in their minds and then they're having questions and it, it well, have I been doing the wrong thing all these years? And, and that's why we as a church have to be ready and that's only one of many issues but we have to be ready to answer those in a loving way, in a compassionate way. And so this is very practical. How do we maintain unity within the body? The same way Paul was helping them to have lowliness of mind. So notice in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all. I, we talked about the body last time. How does that unify us? Well, we, we showed that the body has one head, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's important because the head is the one, is the part of the body that tells the rest of the body what to do. And so we look for our orders from Jesus Christ. So all of us are to be getting our direction and our guidance from Jesus Christ through the scriptures. The body has a head. That unifies us. We're all in Christ. The body has many members, yet one body. There's diversity here. There's diversity in many ways from your family backgrounds. Just as I, I ask you to raise your hands about when you got saved. There's diversity in the economic levels. There's diversity in education. There's a Diversity in giftedness. And by giftedness, I'm talking about spiritual gifts. Or you could say, you could also say uh, diversity in talents. We all have different talents, but the, the Bible indicates that God wants every gift to be used in the body of Christ. And that's what makes it a healthy body. The body has many members that are members of one another. I think that's one of the most important truths that we sometimes don't re realize when we talk about a body full of many members, but that body, the members all hold together. The members all help one another. You've got, in our body, we have the circulatory system. We have the nervous system. We have the digestive system. We have all of these systems that work together. And if we, if we didn't have any one of those, if there was just one of those we didn't have, we'd die. And so we realize that we're dependent on one another. And if we don't realize that, I've had people that have said, I don't, I don't need fellowship. <laughs> That's not true. And somebody that says they don't need fellowship is, is fighting against God. And that's one of the means he's given us to strengthen us. And then we talk, showed how uh, the wife is one with her husband, just like Christ is one with the church. And Paul himself makes that analogy, it's not just an analogy, he says it's actually the case. 
that we are flesh and blood with Jesus Christ. We are part of his body. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11.2, For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And his whole premise for how husbands ought to love their wives is based on the symbolism and the truth that Christ loved the church as his own body. And then the, the next thing that he gives here, the next point is one spirit. How does, how does being having one spirit unify us? Well, at the moment of salvation, every believer is indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. Let me read you Ephesians 1.13. And I, predominantly, I'm trying to use verses from Ephesians so we realize that this is, this is the emphasis of the book. In him you also trusted, that, that's Jesus Christ, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So when a believer is saved, their body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is, God himself moves in and dwells in each believer's body. That is amazing. And that is the reason why, that is one of the reasons why, there is transformation. That's one of the reasons why there's a hunger and a thirst for holiness. When a believer is saved, their body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit, and because he is the Holy Spirit, he gives you a holy desire to live a holy life in the power of the Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that everybody understands all of that right at the beginning. It's a growth process, but there is a desire in their life to do that because they want to please God. They want to please their Savior. Your body is important to God. Because when you, wherever you go, you take the Holy Spirit with you. Whatever you think about, you take the Holy Spirit with you. Whatever you say, you take the Holy Spirit with you. That's kind of sobering, isn't it? That's why we're to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, if you are saved, you have the same Holy Spirit living in you that lives in every other believer. And he doesn't lead us, lead two believers, two individual believers to do two different things, one moral and one immoral. God never does that. The Holy Spirit never does that. He is not divided because that would destroy his body. And let me, let me say something here, just because I, I brought this to light, or at least I, I mentioned this, um, this one thing that can be divisive. Either one translation is inspired or one translation is not inspired. You can't have it both ways. And if there's an inspired translation, then all other translations ought to be able to be translated from that translation. God inspired the original documents. And we have over 6,000 copies or portions of copies of manuscripts. And what I'm just pointing this out because I want us to realize that 
we've got to come to grips with different issues and decide, okay, is this a biblical issue? And then we need to encourage others. We need to, we need to teach others. Notice also the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and they will be according to God's truth because he is the spirit of truth. In John 16, 13, it says, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And it goes on to say that he will glorify Jesus Christ. So it's important for us to understand that the Spirit of God always speaks truth. And that's why what he speaks to you, you can't just say it's the Bible, it's up to your own personal interpretation. No, 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 no. Language means something. And that's why God put his word in language. That's why we need to read it literally. And understand what it is saying. And then we need to submit to it and practice it. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead one person to drink alcohol and another person not to drink alcohol. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead one person to dress immodestly and another person to dress modestly. That would be contradictory to his word and his nature. He is the same spirit and he has given us his word that we can understand what pleases the Lord. And he gives us many things in the word of God, principles and we have to take those things and we have to pray earnestly, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. Just show me. And friends, God will show you because he'll, he'll bring you through the Holy Spirit. If you genuinely are teachable and want God's will and you're willing to do whatever he says through his word, God will make it clear to you. The Lord doesn't lead one person to eat meat sacrificed to idols and another one not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. And there are people today who are justifying what they do based on those passages that talk about meat offered to idols, but they do not come out at the same place that Paul did. When Paul got to the end of his, his explanations and his argumentation of, to the Corinthian church, he said this, if meat causes my brother to stumble, then I will not eat meat as long as the world stands. Paul said that when you eat meat sacrificed to idols, and I know for us, um, eating meat sacrificed to idols, we're not too concerned about that, are we? But see, what the Lord wants us to do is to take that principle and apply it to many other areas. I wonder if you've ever come to a conclusion that maybe something is not a conviction to, to me, but if it's going to cause my brother to stumble, then I'm not going to do it. That's the exact same principle. That's all Paul's doing. He's giving us a timeless principle that we can apply to other areas of our life. Paul said that, he said though to the Corinthians, he said when you share, when you eat meat offered to idols, knowingly, you are sharing in the worship of demons. And then he went a step further and he said, by sharing, you are approving of the worship of demons. That, that's pretty clear. The Lord doesn't lead one to believe in the creation account. The, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, 
doesn't lead one to believe in the creation account and another to believe in evolution as the origin of life. I have a very recent illustration of that on my trip down to Arizona on the airplane in one of the airports. I was reading a book on, on the exemplary husband and um, because I need that. Okay. But I was reading this book and somebody walked by and they said, oh, is that a good book? And I said, yes. And I said, we can all use, we can all become better. And um, that kind of began, it was a man and his wife. And he was very talkative and um, came to find out that they were from a Mennonite background, they, they, he had grown up in the Mennonite church. He was probably in his mid-70s. Um, he had been a scientist, a chemical, I don't know, biochemical something. <laughs> and um, so we started talking and he said he got into the vaccine. Oh, another thing we could divide over too. But he, he was talking about the vaccines and he said, I, have, I am just so disappointed in the church as a whole because of their response to that. And so I, I gave him my opinion. And then I, um, and then he said, could you tell me something? Well, he, he, then he got off on evolution and he said, another thing I don't understand is why the church has rejected the science of evolution. And he, he said, I, and I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior and so forth. And, and then he asked me this question. Could you tell me why people doubt my salvation because I believe in evolution? And I said, well, I can't speak for others, but I could tell you why I think that could be. Others might think that, and that's because they would wonder if you're really a Christian, if you could reject something that is so clear in Scripture. And that, um, then they wonder, you know, then you could take any other portion of Scripture and bend that to your liking. And he, he didn't really answer that, but he, he uh, there were several other things he said, and we talked more and um, we left as friends, but we left definitely disagreeing. But I did tell him, you know, if you, I said Jesus Christ even referred to Adam and referred to Noah about the great flood and all of that. And I said, you're, you're rejecting really what Jesus Christ accepted as the word of God. But he believes that it's science. And, but even that, he said, some of, he said some of the elders came to him and asked him if he would teach a class on origins. And I'm kind of scratching my head about the elders, but um, I, he said, I, I, re, I refused. I, I, I wouldn't do it because I knew it was going to be too controversial. And so he said, but then some of the younger people in the church came up. Some of the young couples said, listen, you need, to, you need to teach this. We need to know this. So it was obvious a, a, a matter of uh, division, or at least it could be, and it should be. There are some things that we do need to divide over. And, but... Um, I, I think later then he did agree to do it because some of the younger people who were probably or may have been a product of public school education. But my whole point in this is simply that there are so many things that can divide the church and we have to know what the issues are and be able to explain from scripture so that we can be unified that's one of the reasons why we've had different um, scientists come in and explain 
creation and the, the problems with evolution, that it is not science. And I pointed that out to him. I said, you can't prove it in a lab laboratory. You can't, it's not repeatable. All of these things I said, yet you're accepting. And I said, DNA is probably one of the greatest testimonies to the fact that one species or one kind cannot evolve into another kind. And, but he, he brought up something that he felt was proof that it could. So, the Lord doesn't lead one person to do one thing and another person to do another thing that are contradictory to one another. We've got to be seeking the truth. And then the fullness of the Spirit is essential for serving in any capacity in the church. Acts 6, 5 says, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And then when we come to the, um, the use of spiritual gifts, the, Paul, Paul taught that everyone needs to, everyone is given a spiritual gift by the Spirit of God, and they need to use it in the power of the Spirit. He said, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so the fullness of the Spirit cultivates, cultivates right motives for what we do. In the Corinthian church, carnality was motivating their choices of gifts and how they use them. And, oh, I want that gift. Rather than being content with the gift that God gave them, the motive of serving the whole body instead of self, that's important. This gift wasn't given to me for, for my um, glorification. It was given to me to serve God's people in lowliness of mind. The motive of serving out of love for others. That's why smack dab in the middle of three chapters talking about spiritual gifts, you have 1 Corinthians 13 on love. Paul was teaching them but I show you a better way, and that is love. And then the motive of contentment or delighting in the gifts that God has given you rather than coveting someone else's position or spiritual gift. This morning at the fellowship for Jonathan and Rachel, I was looking out around the room. I said, where is Don and Jim? And I asked my wife that. I said, where is Don and Jim? You know what she said? They're in the kitchen serving. <laughs> well, that's where I'm used to seeing them, in the serving. I should have known that. I just didn't look in the kitchen. So we, we all have gifts, and we all need to use those gifts for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 12, 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for in fact the body is not one member, but many. See, that keeps us all equal. How would you like to do without your hand? How would you like to do without some other part of your body. No, you'd rather keep it. You'd rather keep it all because all of it has a purpose. But it, it, it helps us to, to have lowliness of mind because we realize that it's not about us, it's about God and about serving others and loving others. And then the Holy Spirit leads and prompts all believers to witness to those around them. Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world. I love this, Acts 8.29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? You know, we might have more experiences, more even miraculous experiences if we just followed the dictates of the Holy Spirit. 
We just, when the Lord prompted us to witness, we did it. Because the Holy Spirit does lead all believers to witness to others. And if you're a believer, you've known what that's like. But sometimes if we resist the Spirit over and over again, then the, the Spirit stops talking to us. He stops prompting us. And our conscience becomes dull and seared. And then the Holy Spirit helps us make spiritual judgments, can, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And that's found in multiple places. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 14. This kind of discernment is needed throughout our lives and it's cultivated by careful application of specific principles in God's word. I was listening to a, um, a pastor speaking to his people and um, he said that the first Sunday that he had come to that church an attender approached him and said, you, you don't eat out on Sundays, do you? <laughs> well, even the way that's worded is divisive. <laughs> you know, it wasn't saying, Pastor, I just honestly want to know, what do you think about this? You know, it was, it was worded in such a way that it just promoted, I don't know if, he had some inclination, maybe he'd seen the pastor go out to eat on Sunday or something, but um, he wasn't asking for advice. He was, it was almost condemning. And the point I'm simply making is there are good people that have come to the conclusion that they shouldn't eat on, out on Sunday. There are other people with a clear conscience feel that it's okay. And you have to come to those conclusions on your own. But the Holy Spirit, if you really want to know, the Holy Spirit helps us make spiritual judgments, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's why one spirit is so important. And I haven't even begun to touch all of it. Friends, it is a blessing that we have God dwelling within us. He does lead us. He does teach us from the word of God. He does allow us to hear from the preaching of the word of God and, and to take things to heart that maybe we haven't thought about. He uses all those things and he is God's personal counsel, counselor to each of us. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't stop here in church. You go home and the Holy Spirit is the one who, if you will follow him and if you'll listen to him, the Holy Spirit is the one who will go with you and he will teach you. And he's better than any man. Now, God is the one who is, who is intentionally um, told us in his word that there are to be evangelists and prophets and teachers and so forth and pastors. But what I'm saying is that God within us trumps it all. But both are done because both are the will of God. So let's rejoice in the fact that we have the Spirit of God dwelling within each of us and let's be seeking Him Let's be seeking to love one another in the decisions that we make so that we can be unified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for how much you give us in your word to help us in these decisions that we make. And I pray, Lord, that as a body, we will be guided not just by the letter of the law, but by also the law of love and the law of lowliness of mind, esteeming others better than ourselves, more important than ourselves, so that there can be unity in the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that with the opportunities that are coming 
our way because of so many ethnicities being present in our country. Lord, that we will take advantage, that we will see them as needy people that need Christ. And I pray that this church, as well as many other churches, would be made up of all kinds of people because you died for them as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.